I went to breakfast the other day and there were no masks on the workers. It was unbelievable. It was nice to see a face and it was especially nice to see a smile. You know, we have spent the last year where it seems like we're in a photo where everybody's face is blurred. We don't see people. People don't really see each other and they don't even speak to each other. You know, the Lone Ranger uh, television show, it always ended with the line, who was that masked man? I feel like people are now more likely to ask who was that unmasked man that was just in our midst. We live in a very strange time. A guy named Jerry Tucker said, bad ideas are like termites. You can't entirely see them and suddenly the whole house falls in. We have had a year, and I think a year without faces, smiles, and conversations is a bad idea. And in attempting to flatten the curve, we've crushed a culture. And in a lost culture, we are surrounded by bad ideas. And because of that, our house is collapsing. You know, it's interesting that at the very end of Paul's life, he wrote to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said this, I have fought the good fight. He didn't say I had a nice, pleasant ride. He said, I fought the good fight. You know, back in the day when dinosaurs were hanging around, when I was growing up, if you wanted to start a fight, you would draw a line in the sand and you'd say, step over that line, I dare you. And if they did, you'd open the Old Testament on them. It would be go time. We are surrounded. There are lines in the dirt all around us. And we have to decide what we're going to do as the body of Christ. You know, Francis As Asbury, he was sent by John Wesley to America to uh, bring the awakening, to help with the awakening that was happening in America. He said to young ministers that he was training, though the devil attacks you in a thousand ways, and though there are problems on every side, you're never happier than when you're in the work of the Lord. It's gonna be a fight. John Wesley himself, he traveled like 3,000 miles in his ministry, most on horseback in America. And he even stayed in America during the entire Revolutionary War. He was the only English Methodist leader to do so. And America was a dangerous place for British pre preachers in 1776. And it is now a dangerous place for a legitimate Bible teaching American preacher in 2021. America is changing. And we're seeing that all around us. You know, on uh, the last day or so, we've seen um, an interview of one of the appointees by the new administration that's going to be dealing with the issue of young boys and young girls in the school system. And, uh, you know, we used to celebrate being the gender that we are. Hollywood was filled with movies that celebrated that, love stories, romantic things. We had, had uh, songs that were always the theme of love between a man and a woman. And now since people have lost their purpose in God, they are desperate for any sense of identity. And we see them reaching out for, for all different things. And now we have boys and girls bathrooms, uh, uh, locker rooms, and even now competing in women's sports. You know, when I was 19 years of age, I, uh, I only competed until I was 19 years of age in, in track and field because at that point, God called me away and I began uh, a life in the ministry and the training for it. But at 19 years of age, I could outrun every person in the world at that time and every person in recorded history and every person that has lived since that time in multiple distances. I could have set records if they would all been women. You see, God has created us radically different in wonderful ways that we need to celebrate those differences and recognize that they are there 
and not in a, in a crazy way sacrifice the very design of how God made us. But that is the culture of 2021 that we have to face as the body of Christ. Francis Chan said, it may be a terrifying thought, but we have to trust God more than we trust ourselves. He said, we are here on this earth for his glory. God has blessed you so that you will use whatever he has given you for his glory, not yours. Ultimately, we should expect God's plan to lead us places where we wouldn't naturally go. We wouldn't naturally look for a fight, but the fight is now looking for us. And we have to decide what we're going to do with the lines that are all around us. And we need to trust God on important issues. Trust his opinions about what a man and a woman is. You know, since the 1960s, fads have come and gone in the American church, <clears throat> and they're replaced by newer fads when those fads get faded. A guy named Leonard Ravenhill, who was a preacher from uh, Britain, shortly before he died, he said this, People say the church today is growing and expanding. Yes, it's 10 miles wide and about a quarter inch deep. You know, we, the church needs faith. It doesn't need fads. And fads are like plastic surgery to fool us and the world around us into thinking that age is not winning the battle against us. We're just fooling ourselves. And we're fooling ourselves when we look at culture and don't think that we are losing a battle that the church is somehow not what the church should be or culture would not be what the culture has become. A.W. Tozer said almost everything the church is doing these days has been suggested to her by the world. He said a new Decalogue has been adopted by the neo-Christians of our day. The first word of which reads, Thou shalt not disagree. And the new set of Beatitudes too, which begins with, Blessed are they that tolerate everything, for they shall be made accountable for nothing. You know, imagine an offense and a defense in a football game. Before every play, they would come in the, into the same huddle together to call that play. And that's what we've done with the church. We brought the world and the church together to decide what the church is supposed to go forward with. You know, we have either Americanized the gospel or spiritualized the American dream. Neither one comes close to what the gospel is. Is this what Christianity is supposed to look like? No conflict with the world, in a world that's immoral, in a world that actually hates God, and there's supposed to be no friction, no conflict, in 2004, in the country of Jordan, Muhammad Abad was a, was a convert to Christianity. He was arrested on charges of apostasy. He refused to renounce his Christian faith and was found guilty, and he was stripped of his civil rights. The court ruling stated that he had no longer a legal religious identity, and therefore he possessed no property rights, he could not be legally employed. He, uh, it also declared that his marriage was now annulled and that he could only remarry his wife if he converted back to Islam and potentially he could lose custody of his children. That's what real Christianity really looks like. The Chinese underground church, uh, one of the leaders said, in the early days we didn't have time for discord. We were involved in trench warfare together and were united in heart. We were arrested together, tortured together. We shared the same prison cells and counted it all joy to suffer for Jesus' name together. Whenever we are really living Christianity, then all of the dividing factors go by the wayside. The one thing that I read about the Chinese church, which was a detriment to them was when people were sending them Bibles, they began to put their own denominational materials inside the boxes. And when the Chinese church began to look at those things that divided the church elsewhere, it began to cause divisions among them, and they finally said, we don't want any more. 
All we want is all we want are the Bibles. All we want are the things that unite us together. And maybe this fight is going to be, you know, they're talking about the Great Reset. Maybe this fight will be the Great, re great Reset for the church where we will become one together and remove all these things that are dividing us. Mark Batterson said, when you try to add something to the gospel, you aren't enhancing it. The gospel is as good as it gets. You only get relationship with God on his terms. You can take it or leave it, but you cannot change the rules of engagement. You know, the, the reality is that we're as spiritual as we want to be. And uh, if we we're passionate about the Lord Jesus Christ, we would make some changes. We'd make changes in our schedule. We'd stop worrying about what people's perception is about us. We wouldn't live in fear of our peers, and we'd cast aside whatever is hindering us from our pursuit of Christ and recognize that he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, God counts it a tragedy. Uh, <clears throat> Irwin McManus said, God counts it as tragedy when we choose to simply watch life rather than live it. Jesus described as wicked the person who leaves his talents unused. When we fail to choose, we, we choose to fail. You cannot put your life on hold. It moves forward with or without your approval. If you're a Christian, you have a strategic role, a strategic role to play rather than just filling a church pew or helping with a church budget. You have an assignment, a God-given assignment, and you're never going to find the abundant life that you crave apart from living out that assignment. And God has your back. God will be there. When you step out on obedience, when you get out on that limb, God will be there to sustain you. You know, Richard Wormbrand, he was um, called to a meeting where the political leader had called other church meetings, other church leaders to that meeting to denounce Wormbrand for poisoning youth and attacks on the government. He said, you may be sure that he will never preach again. He, he shouted until he was in this, this rage. At the end, he cried, Wormbrand is finished, Wormbrand is finished, Wormbrand is finished. He gathered up his coat, stormed out of the building, and a hundred yards from the door, a car swerved to miss a dog, drove on the sidewalk, and crushed him against the wall, and he died on the spot. He was finished. The Bible says that Jesus is a forerunner, and a forerunner was some, a term that referred to a person who would jump from a boat, swim to the shore, and then by means of a rope, guide the boat to landing where it wouldn't strike the rocks and be destroyed. God has our back. It's time to stop watching and start living, to start, to start fighting the good fight, because the bell's going to ring, and our last round is going to end someday. And you want to make sure that you got into the scuffle. And then you didn't just sit back and watch life go by. 